Okay, so the idea behind this podcast was I just want to get more voices out on YouTube. Not that you guys don't have your own YouTube channel. I think there's a whole lot more room for more machining content out there. And this was, I think, a good way of getting a lot of voices heard. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Tell me about Servent Solutions. What do you guys do? So we are, right now we just have a three axis sill and we just do job shop work for pretty much anything that we can fit inside our build volume. And how long have you guys been in business? A little less than two years. We started in September, 2020. And your brothers? Yeah. We are, yep. <laughs> Tell me about how Servent Solutions got started. Like what first made you think, oh, I need to go machine stuff with my brother and do business? I always wanted to get into machining. And at first I'm like, oh, James, we should really get like a bridge port. And he was like, no, I don't want a bridge port. So then the pandemic happened and we were stuck at home like everyone else. I'm like, okay, we're not just going to sit at home doing nothing. Let's do something. So James was like, oh, I found this like random machine we can get, a Tormach. I was like, I'm no, no, no. It's, we started with wanting to get a Tag, and exactly. just like, just modify it but thank goodness that didn't happen yeah so we, we look at the Tormach. we're like okay this isn't that bad of a price the 440 and if we crash it if we won't get hurt it won't get hurt that bad so let's just start with this so we just got the very base model we designed up the entire enclosure james was working at a sheet metal place at that point so they bent everything for us powder coated it i welded up the frame in my neighbor's driveway and then we just started making chips see what would happen yeah, it was uh, it was pretty random. I kind of watched a lot of like Titans of CNC on YouTube, and I was kind of like, oh, that looks like a lot of fun. And I also wanted to be able to like implement ideas of our own that at the company I was working at they wouldn't let us that they wouldn't let me do. So I was kind of like, oh, if I start my own business, then I can make any changes or improvements I want to without anyone telling me no, unless they were really bad ideas. What kind of machining background did you have before starting Servent Solutions? <laughs> so I have blue collar background because I used to, I, from 14 until like 20, I was doing plumbing. And then I'm a mechanical engineer. James is going for mechanical engineering right now. And we had zero machining. Yeah, it was just, <laughs> just YouTube. It was just, we thought it was cool. Yeah. And so what was the thought process behind the Tormach? Honestly, it was, it was small enough to fit in the garage and low, low, budget enough to like not break the bank so like <laughs> if nothing worked <laughs> yeah like we didn't need to take out a loan on it if if it didn't work out oh well it was like what eight eight grand i think they've actually gone up a decent bit since like inflation hit i think mm -hmm. i think the price has gone up almost like two or three grand since when we got the base model so uh yeah it was just a low cost option and what kind of clients do you do work for? We do a lot of Zometry right now, but before we got on Zometry, we had made parts for uh, paramotors, these wallet parts for uh, case makers, just like really anything <coughs> that I was able to find on either Facebook or Instagram, anyone that was willing to give us work. We did work for some random guy that made branding irons. <laughs> so, so talk to me about Zometry. Zometry is probably the most hated thing like <laughs> in the machinist community. Well, okay, not the most hated, the most controversial topic. That's a better way. Yeah, because yeah, either I really don't know anyone that has like a happy medium with Zometry. It's either you love it or you hate it. So we personally love it because it works great around our schedule. So Sean works full time. I do college full time. So our machining hours are usually like a couple nights a week from like five to like one in the morning. <laughs> It's hard to take on customers when you're doing those kind of hours because you have no repeatable schedule. But with Zometry, we can just we can go on the job board and just look through the jobs and be like, yeah, I can do this this week. Or like, the fact that you can you have jobs literally presented to you with preset prices and the deadline given to you and the option to take them or decline them is kind of like nothing else. I know there's like prototype hubs in some smaller companies coming up. But there's really no other options out there like that. So for us, it's literally perfect. So what was the what was the onboarding process like with Zometry? So all we had to do was make the test part. And all we had to do. <laughs> had to do yeah. How many times did it take? It, it, we literally scrapped like 30 of them because from from like day one of getting the Tormac, we we're like, okay, we're gonna like get onboarded with Zometry right away. So pretty much we started trying the test part like right away, and we literally knew like nothing. So it was like. Some of the first ones we made were just utter garbage. Like everything about them was just trash. And 
we thought they were good at first just because like it was so novel we thought they were good but they were they were just garbage and we recently found videos of us doing it while we're, and we're like here the the poor tool like screaming for help we're like oh that sounds really good and like the surface finish is atrocious so it's really cool seeing the videos so of where we were and then how far we've come in such a short amount of time just because again either it's zometry giving us the experience once we pass or it's just other customers we're learning how to do it and just getting better with it so we had submitted one of the zometry parts and at first we didn't really have like the best inspection equipment for it so we failed the first one and they're actually surprisingly tough on the part probably a little like unreasonably tough only because so their tolerance is like plus or minus five thou so the measuring is usually uh like a tenth of that so it would be increments of like half a thou but they were measuring they use like a cmm so they measure everything to like the tenth and their inspection report came out and it was just like it was actually like crazy detailed uh, a lot of red. We failed like two of the dimensions by like three tenths on one and a oh, tenth man. on another. So <laughs> they give you plus or minus five thou, but if you're measuring with calipers like we did, you have to like go like three or four thou. Okay. Like you can't be right on the edge because you're probably going to be out. And once we ended up passing the part, they paid us like five hundred dollars, which I don't know. Like for us, that was awesome. For like a, a good machinist, that's not actually that bad because I'm pretty sure it should really only take like an hour if we did if we were to like remake it now. So. I'd say that's not a really bad price. And you could do it out of Delrin or stainless. We obviously yeah. chose Delrin. Yeah. It was a lot cheaper and easier to screw up. And then you do like a 30 minute onboarding call with them. It's just really simple. It was pretty much like, do this, don't do this. Like if you put your own stuff in the box, you literally get kicked off geometry. Just like basic rules. Then once we were on, it was pretty much just like jobs started showing up. And then the more we started taking, the more the algorithm kind of like favors us almost. Hmm. So at first our job board would just be full of like everything, lathe parts, mill parts, 60 inch long parts. The, what we've started taking is like all sub six inch parts. I don't think we've ever taken a zombie job over six inches or over like 10 pieces. And now everything is on the job board is just like, it's small sub six inches, low quantities. Like it starts to morph into only what you want to do which is pretty awesome because now almost all the jobs on the board are, are like doable pretty much unless the prices are like ridiculous. Yeah. So let's see, you have a new machine now, but you started with Zometry on your 440, right? How many jobs, yeah, how many jobs did you take on the 440 before upgrading? 12, 15. I think it may have been like, I think it was 17 or 18. We made, we made 10 grand on Zometry with the 440. So, so it, it paid for itself yeah oh yeah yeah it paid for itself and towards the last two weeks of having the 440 we made four grand Mm -hmm. so like most of that was in that like last two weeks i'd say i wouldn't want to do it again with the 440 but it's definitely doable it definitely seems like a low barrier of entry to get into it like a machining business it's kind of surprising what it can actually handle. Like uh-huh. what we were turning, I mean, we, we did jobs for zometry, so it couldn't have been that bad and everything was in spec. So when we were doing the different material and everything, we were like, wow, like this is surprising that I can handle it. I mean, obviously everything's much slower. You can't be that aggressive with it, but no, it was definitely worth it. And did you have the ATC for the Tormach? Uh, my little sister was the ATC. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> yeah. 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 She was disappointed with the new sill. She's like, oh, can I run this one? And we're like, you see that right there? That's your replacement. And she wasn't happy about that. <laughs> it's a lot faster. Though. Yeah. So talk to me about the sill. The sill is honestly like, we're pretty shocked. So we had like, you know, there's so little info on the sill, mm-hmm. which they're kind of working on more though. I think they just redid the website like two days ago. They're getting a new okay. website put out. But um, there's like barely any YouTube videos, barely any like uh, support. I mean, the, the support dudes are really helpful, which is good. But um, as far as like getting the machine, the machine was really easy to, to deliver. We used like riggers and I would never do what we did with the Tormac again, which was like the engine hoist. Like <laughs> that just gave me such anxiety. I hated that so much. So I would gladly pay another like 1500 to riggers any day. I'd say that's where the Tormac was a little better because the, the Tormac is literally like plug and play. Like, mm-hmm. okay, you put the enclosure on or whatever, you put it on the base, but it's so, Pathpilot is so easy to use. Like with yep. the, how long did it take you to figure out how to use the controller for the LNC? Oh, uh, well, I mean, there's no videos on it. So it was literally 
me like, okay, let's see what this does. And we were having an issue where I got the tool changer to work once and then it just wouldn't work again. So we just had a random tool stuck in there. And it took, oh, what was it, like President's Day weekend, I had a three-day weekend, the entire weekend, just looking at the machine, trying to figure it out. And the, the LNC controller has four dials right in the front. There's like the different machine um, settings. There's the um, linear travel speed, uh -huh. the spindle speed. And then the fourth one, I'm like, don't know what it is. So when in doubt, off. And yeah. that was the exact opposite thing <laughs> I should have done because the ATC wouldn't work. Uh, a bunch of other stuff wouldn't work. And then randomly out of desperation, I'm like, let me just turn it to 25. And then the whole machine worked and we could run it. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever find out what that dial does? Like other than making your machine work? It's, it's, we would just talk about it. It's right? like the traverse speeds. So it's like, um, it's like whatever macro you're running, it's the automatic speed. Oh, interesting. So when you go to do a tool changer, it'll come up, yeah. do the tool, and then it controls that speed. It's really important. The control is a lot more complicated than Pathpilot. Pathpilot was amazing because it was like left, right, up, down, like start program. Like it's, it's more complicated, but you could definitely do a lot more with this. Controller. Yeah, it's true. But like barrier to entry, like Tormax way easier for that. But then in terms of like rigidity, speed, uh, pricing. So I like to compare it to the Haas Mini Mill and the 1100 MX because that's his price range and competitors. I'd say in terms of rigidity, it's more than the 1100 MX and the Haas Mini Mill because it's got like the okay. Schneeberger or some weird name, yep. granite casting. Uh, the thing is, just, I think it's like 50, uh, 4,500 <clears throat> pounds. It's it's so rigid. Like if you put your hand on the the what's it called the enclosure while it's machining, you could like feel it vibrate. The second you put it on like the uh, the granite casting, like just nothing at all. It's so solid. In terms of cost, I think ours was thirty six hundred, uh, thirty six grand. Somewhere there. It, it was like thirty six grand, and that was before rigging. But it came yeah. with a uh, jog wheel, coolant hose, air blast gun. We got the twelve thousand RPM. Twelve thousand RPM spindle. Mm -hmm. 12 pocket tool changer and um single phase so i think the fan control and the seamless control are a little more for the yeah. three phase one and then it's obviously going to be like two grand for a phase converter or whatever if you're going with like american rotary definitely a little more than the 1100 mx but not by much i think how much was your 1100 mx yeah, for context i think i paid thirty-one thousand delivered for my mx yeah. which includes tool holders and the probe though i didn't get too much in the way of upgrades for it I did get the enclosure and the, the tool changer. It's 10,000 RPM, right? Yes, 10K. That's nice, yeah. Is it a lot nicer than the uh, the old 1100 MX? Oh, <laughs> or it's, 1100? The, it's a world of difference from that old 1100. <laughs> uh, just the, the the biggest thing for me is the spindle speed because I do yeah. kind of a lot of smaller tools and finishing. Yeah. Uh, and then the rapid speed difference is also just a world of difference. Like It's yeah. such a huge improvement. That's awesome. Now I just need to get the thing hooked back up again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for that's the other thing. The speed on the sill is insane. I think it's uh -huh. 1100 inch per minute rapids. So we usually run it at 25% or yeah, 25% rapids. But uh, if, if we, if the program's proven, we'll just crank it up to hundred and it's crazy. Like the table, like even today we were chamfering from like two inches apart from holes. And it was just like the speed just going from uh -huh. hole to hole. It's, it's impractical for like the one or two parts that we're making out at a time like that's usually our order size but it's just it's still a nice thing to have and the 12,000 rpm is nice too because yeah. i think uh last week we were running like a 10 thou ball mill uh -huh. so like <laughs> that was that was insane but being able to run that just 20 percent faster is so much nicer because usually like the cycle times on tools like that is ridiculous yeah and uh i think the last thing that is absolutely amazing is how strong the coolant is uh -huh. like our tool life has just gone through the roof for like slotting and stuff and 16 inch 16th inch tools like the coolant is it's like a jet it's crazy i i'm used to like the the uh the 440 the mist, the yeah. mist yeah. and like trying to point the little mist stream at the the end mill which which did fine for what it was but uh all oh, the coolant's just so much nicer does it have a like air blast option or is it just flood there's air blast I wouldn't say it's great. The lock line's a little short, so it doesn't get very close. So mm. it's not really directed, but it's not that bad. Okay. And let's see, no through spindle coolant, I'm assuming. No, mm, I okay. think that they have a 30,000 RPM HSK version of the machine. 
and that one it has through spindle but that option is like insanely expensive it like doubles the price of the machine if i remember right. yeah, really. yeah it's insane i i still really want one of their t-series machines they, their... i think they just continued the t-series now Did they really so it still literally changes every day like yeah the, the company changes every day so there you've seen the new um x uh, x series with like the five seven yes. nine and eleven they pretty much just increase the rapids and stuff and okay. that's pretty much like the new t series pretty much just phased them out my next machine may very likely be a sill though honestly the thing that's going to determine my next machine is the the clearance height of how high of a door i can get it through fair enough <laughs> yeah i to get my 1100 mx in the door i had to remove a piece of trim on my garage door <laughs> and the feet off the bottom of it and even That's then funny. it's still just like barely scraped by and then or the one the rigger delivered the machine he was telling us about this guy in our town who he got a vf4 put in his basement Ooh. and he had to punch a hole through his living room First ceiling floor. and now there's a coffee table built around the z <laughs> column of the vf4 in his house so. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, so I want to go back to Zometry a little bit. Yeah. How how has it changed for you now that you have a more capable machine? We've definitely we feel more confident in what we can take on, and every time we get a new job, we're like, oh, how are we going to do this? And that's part of the excitement because you get to figure out. You'll have an idea. Like we'll be daydreaming in class or at work and be like, oh, how do we figure out this part? And then go home, test it out, and if it works, we're like awesome. Now we can add that to our capabilities and if it doesn't work then we'll have to get creative and try something new mm -hmm. so this machine definitely the repeatability helps us to pump out more parts and in a lot quicker amount of time and then with the more or the higher rpm or the higher horsepower that we have now we can definitely mm -hmm. take more aggressive cuts and then not really be afraid to tackle like copper and brass because i know before with the 440 Either we were running it wrong, which is very possible, <laughs> good possibility, or the 440 just really wasn't that happy. But oh, now it's stainless, in yes, yeah. we could do stainless with the 440. It was uh -huh. not happy with the sill. We can definitely take on 440. Brass and copper were never too bad, but like uh, long wall heights were mm -hmm. where it gets yeah. really gummy. Like we we could literally never take a job past like a three quarter inch wall height because we don't know why we tried everything. Our Oh, Our man. 440 tool pullout was just like a bear. We got a new, we got new washers. We got a new R8 collet. Like everything about that was just such a, a bear. Wouldn't it pull out in plastic? Yeah, it was pulling yeah, it was out pulling in plastic. Delray. <laughs> like it was so frustrating. We had to like uh, get rid of like using all three eighths inch end mills. It was just quarter inch by the end. Yep. Yeah, I say I've always heard that the Tormox. Even, you know, the 1100 has always liked smaller tools. I believe it. It's not surprising, yeah. Uh, I think 3 8 is kind of the, like, the perfect tool for my MX. Big enough that it's got rigidity, but it's also small enough that you can make use of the higher spindle speed and the faster faster moves and just kind of buzz around parts instead of taking big, yeah. uh, chunky cuts. Uh, how are, what are you making with the 440 primarily right now? Pry bars? You mean the, the MX? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, right now it's, I mean, basically a paperweight because I don't actually, I do have power hooked up to it now. I just need to reassemble the enclosure. I'm doing the finishing on the pry bars for the Kickstarter. The other day, I just cut them out of their window frames okay. and ground off the, the tabs that are left. And then today I should hopefully finish up sandblasting them. Okay, nice. cool. And do you, is sandblasting the last step or do you tumble them after? And then they get tumbled. Okay. Yeah, so I, I grind off the tabs, then I sandblast them, and then I tumble them. And the sandblasting leaves, and I use a really aggressive heavy media that leaves really deep pits and a really okay. rough finish. And then when I tumble them, it smooths out the top of those those rough pits, but like you still get the, the pitting in the, the surface. So it's okay, kind of like an cool. orange peel effect. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's cool. It also really goes a long way to hide any like inconsistencies in the the grinding or tool marks or okay. anything. And your Kickstarter did really well. Congrats on that. Thank you. Yeah, it it was pretty cool. Yeah, it was like uh just shy of five K, if I remember right, like forty six hundred. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, so it's like two hundred forty percent or whatever it was, because you went for yeah. two grand. I don't remember what my goal was set at. But 
Something like that. Definitely yeah. past it. <laughs> yeah. And let's see, I, I've kind of split them into two different batches. The first batch is all the way machined down. Like I said, I'm just need to finish sandblasting and tumble them and they can be shipped. Then I have like 10 or 12 pry bars left of people who didn't give me their information soon enough. And I still need to machine those. So as okay. soon as I get the first batch out, then I'll get the machine put back together, get those machined and get them out the door. Are you using anything specific for uh, shipping? Because that's something we've kind of been like looking at. So every single time we have to ship something, we just go to like the UPS website and it's slow. Oh, and no, that's the worst. Things, like, no, don't do that. There's like ship station and like some, yeah. like those other things. Do you recommend anything? In the past, well, right. So right now, almost everything I'm doing, I'm shipping through Etsy. And the Etsy system is the best. It's super okay. easy okay. to use. I just hit a button. My label printer prints out a label. I stick it on the package. That's awesome. Uh, that does not work for you guys. No. Um, no. Before, Zometry is similar, actually. They give you all that, but okay, other that, customers. That's good. Um, before Etsy, I used stamps.com. The UI for it was like slow. Like you, like even with my gigabit internet connection, I would hit a button and then I would wait and then it would do something and then I would hit a button and then I would wait. <laughs> um, but it did a really good job at mass shipments and like order management. Mm. Um, with the biggest downside being that there was a monthly fee, but it was like 20 bucks or something like that or 10 bucks a month. I'm going to try out a new service called Pirate Ship for okay. for the Kickstarter pry bars. Um, I think I've used it once or twice just like poking around, but never on like a mass scale. Um, but Pirate Ship does not have any fees and a, they oh, have a better UI. Nice. Is that the one that Yates Precision uses? He probably uses ShipStation. Okay. A lot of machinists seem to use ShipStation, and I think it's because it integrates with um, Shopify. Oh, okay. okay. But I've never actually tried it. And I think it's kind of expensive, too. Mm -hmm. Don't quote me on that, but I, no I want to say it's 20 or 30 bucks a month. I'll try the free thing first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Try Pirate Ship. I've, I've only heard good things about Pirate Ship. Yeah, I'll have to okay. try that then. Um, and if that fails, stamps.com is great. Nice. Did you get your free scale with it? Yes, I did. Nice. <laughs> Though you have to pay shipping, and they charge you like seventeen dollars worth of shipping. Oh, that's right. Oh, really? yeah. <laughs> so free. Yeah, exactly. I do still use that scale though for all of my all of my shipping. That's great. <laughs> well, any parting thoughts? Ooh, I don't know. Definitely try out Zometry. It's worth it. Yeah, we've had nothing but good experience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have been meaning to make that test part. I think as soon as the Kickstarter is done and I have my machine back together, I think I'll, I'll do it. Are you going to do uh, Delrin or stainless? I'm going to do the stainless. I actually think it'll be easier. Really? Yeah, because um, it has some like kind of tall, pointy features with a thin base. And I would be worried that the flexing on the base in the Delrin would cause yeah that, yeah, that was an issue we yeah. had to make like a like a, a little intricate vacuum fixture to hold it down and it was like our 30th idea <laughs> yeah I, I actually think the stainless will be easier slower but easier probably. yeah probably yeah, yeah. that would be cool to do stainless on the tarmac though i mean all my pry bars are pre-hardened 4140 oh okay for some reason we're just like we just have not approached steel yet like we've been able to get this far without literally like ever taking a steel <laughs> job yet and it's just like a mystery to us somehow i think i'm going to do a lot more steel because it's similar in price to aluminum at least by volume yeah. not by weight it's not that much more difficult to cut in fact like you don't get the galling issues and the the chip weld issues like you do with aluminum mm. now you go through tools That's faster but i think it's actually easier to get something right the first try i think so mm. One of the very first jobs we took, I think, scared us away from steel <laughs> because we had the 440. We had no enclosure and we had to machine these little stainless parts. 304. 304. No clue what we were doing. No coolant. So we just had our safety goggles on with no enclosure <laughs> and just WD-40 spraying the whole time. Like, it, is the so tool bad. still there? We blew through so many tools, finally at <laughs> one part, and we're like, we don't like stainless. So I think we'll have to get past that fear. <laughs> yeah, I... I think there's like I think steel isn't that bad, and with the kind of products that I do, there is a connection in the human brain between weight and quality, 
And oh, definitely. Yeah. It, like, once upon a time, it was like, oh, this is so light. This must be, you know, so high tech. But now <laughs> it's kind of wrapped back around to where, like, aluminum always feels cheap in your hand. Yeah. And a steel part is like, wow, this is hefty. But, like, even with my trays, I was thinking about making all of my trays steel. That actually be cool. What would you use, like, 1018 maybe? Have you done any more titanium? A friend on Discord has a or is getting a 1100 mx and he was wondering what it was like to machine small slots in titanium and was like well mm. i have a block of titanium and i have some small <laughs> tools and let's see how it goes and yeah it, it it went until i started um ramping up the depth of cut and then broke the tool but um, it did it yeah slotting doesn't seem to like depth of cut that much <laughs> no yeah i think i started off at like 10 thou and then went to 15 thou and then at 20 thou it broke <laughs> oh, that's sad. Actually, what was the diameter? Uh, it was a one thirty second inch end mill. Fifteen thousand, that bad though. That's, no, it's that's really not. Pretty good. That's pretty impressive. We usually like zometry lead times are really really short. So if we don't have enough tools on hand, like we're screwed if we break them. So our our go to slotting depth is like five thou, hmm. and then just like let it run and sit. <laughs> we're we're pretty bad with like efficient speeds and feeds, but we don't have a very big tool library with like a lot of the same tools. So we kind of <laughs> get to be conservative right now. All right. Well, we had a great time on yeah. the very first episode. We're happy to be the number one and we look forward to coming back maybe soon. So where would you guys like to be found on the internet? YouTube at servant solutions and Instagram at servant solutions.